um, and um, and mute your mics. I think we've all gotten pretty used to that by now. Um, can everyone who is here just type in the chat real quick um, your name and then if you're a parent, an educator, or a um, community member. Uh, and the chat box, I don't use Zoom very much, but I believe it's at the bottom. You can find that. Um, and then as we're going along with the presentations, feel free to add any questions you have to the chat box and um, we will monitor that. I just wanted to go through real quick our upcoming trainings. Um, and we'll also talk about this at the end of the um, presentation and I'll leave it up a little bit so everybody can get a chance to look at it. Um, but registration can be found on the Southern Regional Center for Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs website. And we will put a link up for that too, um, in case you need it. Uh, we, the full gamut from February to May, um, we have presentations on ADRC, um, workforce development, um, or DVR, uh, health care changes too, um, looking at youth health transition initiatives. Um, we have a benefit specialist coming to talk about how to navigate those systems. Um, we have uh, individuals from uh, colleges coming to talk about higher education and students with disabilities. Um, guardianship and supported decision making. And then at the end, we're just going to do a wrap up with a really great presentation from Family Voices. Um, before I start, also, if you can just um, stay for just a couple of minutes at the end, we're just going to do a real quick wrap up. Um, so today's presentation, um, we are welcoming Suzanne Daly. Um, she is a parent of a student in the DeForest School District. Um, and she's going to talk about her experiences with transition planning from a parent's perspective. Um, and then we have Brian Kinney. He is joining us from the Transition Improvement Grant. Um, he's an expert in the transition process. Um, and we'll share insights and information to help schools and families team up to support students' goals. So um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to just put those in the chat and um, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for coming. Suzanne, do you wanna, I'll stop sharing here. So hello, I'm Suzanne, and uh, we have um, a son who um, is 19, and he's in his first year of um, the transition, the Beyond 18 program. Um, and thank you, Melissa, for asking me to share um, some of our experiences, and hopefully this will be beneficial to you as well. Um, to get started, um, as I was writing some notes, the the common thread that just kept coming into my mind is that you don't know what you don't know. And that can be very overwhelming as a parent um, when you're trying to provide the best opportunities for your child. And sometimes you just have to step back and breathe and realize that there are so many resources, so many people available um, to help, but you need that direction as to know who to ask for help and how they can help you. Um, one thing that uh, we attended um, throughout the process before our son started uh, the transition is we went to many of the, um, the fairs that had uh, the booths that had the different agencies that had information. And so we collected all the information that there was um, but it became very overwhelming and didn't really know, you know, when, when he was 16, 
um, what long-term support was, or should we be worrying about this now, or what guardianship looks like, and, and if he needed that. And so I think that as you go through the process, um, you know, just kind of having a checklist, you know, at 16 or at 17, this is what you need to worry about. At 18, this is what you need to worry about because otherwise it just becomes so overwhelming and it's easy to miss deadlines or miss um, opportunities uh, to be able to do things in the right order. Um, and so that, um, just don't overwhelm yourself. Um, our son took on the extra challenge of um, not only doing the Beyond 18 program, but wanted to um, take some college classes. And so he's taking a couple classes at Madison College. And what I would say is that, you know, when your child was in high school, they had the benefit of a case manager who could help them navigate everything that they needed to worry about before school, after school, during, and having those aides to assist in many of those classes. Um, you won't have that in the college environment, um, especially this environment in which with COVID so much has gone online. Um, he was fortunate to have one class that he was, was in person, um, a Phi Ed class. And so he was able to uh, interact with other um, adults his age. Uh, but what was very beneficial to him was to talk to the Disabilities Resource Center at the college. And it doesn't matter what college it would be. Um, they're there to help um, determine what the needs are and how they can receive assistance in their classes. Um, I also happen to be an instructor at Madison College. And I can tell you from an instructor's perspective that I have seen many students come through that I know they should have an accommodation, but I never see an accommodation card. And when you go to college, and you go to a disabilities resource center um, once your accommodation is determined. For an example, uh, say your child may need extra time to take a test or they may need their test read to them as opposed to visual um, or they may need a note taker because they can't keep up. Um, all of those accommodations are available for your child. Um, and so it's important that your child takes advantage of that. I see many students who, I know they've gone to the Disability Resource Center, they've received their accommodation cards, but they never turn them into the instructor. And some of it has to do with pride or independence. Um, and, they, and students have told me, I, I wanted to see if I could do it on my own. I wanted to see if I could do it without help. And you know, that's very valent. And, you know, that's good that they want that independence. But it's really important that if they need the help to get the help. Um, because college is just a whole, whole nother level. And there, there isn't the help, there's not the aide sitting in the classroom with them. There's not the help after class that that they had in high school. And so once the instructor is aware that there's accommodations, um, they can really help. And instead of um, being an obstacle to the student's success. And so I highly recommend that if your child is looking to, um, to go the higher education um, route um, through the transition, um, that they take advantage of those accommodations. Um, he also has a job and worked a lot with DVR uh, and worked with a, um, uh, an agency um, to help him uh, come up with a resume to do 
uh, practice interviews. And he actually worked for two summers before he was able to get a job. And it's not going to happen overnight. And he was very lucky to get a job at, um, at a company that is very, um, very receptive um, to his unique uh, needs and are willing to work with him. Um, so he's very lucky there. Um, it's important for your, your student to advocate for themselves if they need extra help at the workplace or an, an example with our son, um, he has sensory issues uh, and he happens to handle money in the course of his job. And so after every time he touches money, he has to hand sanitize his, his hands because of, of that sensory and his hands were just getting raw because um, of doing that. And so he was able to take a, just a washcloth and a little baggie that he can hide under the, under the register that when he needs you know, to, to wipe his hand, he can do that. Um, and so the employer had no problem with that at all. Uh, but it's just little things like that that can make the job experience really great for your child or um, a really miserable time. And, and we want any, any time that they're improving themselves or, or being productive to be successful. Um, as far as um, guardianship goes, one thing that we did learn of course, you can, uh, if your child needs you as a guardian, that you can go through the process before they're 18. Um, we waited till after he was 18 to go through the process. And he knew that he needed help in certain areas. And it's not as restrictive as you think. Really look into guardianship and how, um, how your child isn't going to lose all of their um, all of their say in their life just by having a guardian. Um, it can be very flexible, and it turned out to be a real um, great experience for all of us. Um, and uh, it, going through the the process of going in front of the judge was um, was very um, easy and not as um, intimidating because. Um, because our child knew that, that that was something that he needed help with. Um, as far as long-term support goes, um, ADRC, and I'm sure that, that they'll provide a lot of information when, when it's their, their Tuesday night to speak, um, they were, they've been tremendous to work with. Um, and the great thing about um, the reps at ADRC is that they don't tell you what programs to, to go to or, or what to use, but they give you information about that particular need, whether it's long-term support or, or whatever it is, um, so that you can make an informed choice. Um, and that was very helpful, really putting things in layman's terms um, and making it not be so overwhelming. The Beyond 18 program um, that Melissa has, um, has provided uh, uh, for the students, I, I can't speak enough to how, how beneficial this has been. And um, I'm sure she can tell you just how challenging it can be um, sometimes, especially with our child, that um, really going through the process of um, at 19, he wants to be an adult. You know, his age says he's an adult, um, but yet isn't, isn't quite there in that decision-making process or, or being able to be independent. And that's probably the most frustrating part of, um, of what he goes through right now um, is people are still, you know, telling him what to do when he thinks he should make his own decisions. And, um, you know, he's, he's learning to get through it. And um, it's wonderful when uh, 
Melissa will tell us, you know, how far he's come, you know, we're too close to it. We, we don't see the progress um, as well as others um, have seen with our child. Um, but it's really great to hear those things and to know that um, where he's where he is now compared to where he came from um, is, is just incredible. So sometimes step back from your day-to-day -day view of, of your child and just really look at how far they've come and uh, what great potential that they have um, to navigate their own future. Um, and with that, I, I would say um, my last words would be um, just staying in communication, staying in contact with um, the different resources that are available, um, whether it's ADRC, DVR, uh, Melissa, um, because um, these people are really here to help and uh, you don't have to, um, don't have to do it all alone. So thank you very much, Melissa, for having me tonight. Thank you so much. That was really, really informative. Thanks for coming. All right, Brian, you're up. All right, sorry, I had to change positions. I have just had knee surgery 10 days ago, so I'm, I have to elevate my knee every once in a while. I'm starting to feel a lot better though, so that's a good thing. Um, like Melissa said, um, I work for the Transition Improvement Grant. We're a statewide discretionary grant and we covered uh, various regions across Wisconsin. And I have the pleasure of uh, covering Dane County is one of my counties along with several other counties in the South Central, Southeastern and Southwestern part of the state. And transition is something that I've been doing for a long time. I was a special education teacher um, for most of my career in the Dells School District where I live now. And I've always uh, been very kind of attracted to the field of um, education and probably my my biggest connection to kids is working with kids who are very challenged um, behaviorally. I really enjoy um, the experience of being patient with somebody and never giving up on them and realizing that the income is in the outcome. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen and I have, um, couple different resources that I wanna share. This looks really overwhelming, um, but it's really not. It's just one link. Um, this is a Padlet. Uh, Padlet is something that I really like to organize myself when I'm sharing resources. Um, Melissa's gotten to be pretty fond of Padlets also. She, uh, she didn't know what it was at first, but I think she'll even admit she's a little bit of a, uh, a Padlet junkie like me. Um, it's really nice because it can organize resources in a horizontal um, and a vertical manner that's very neat and clean. So I put together this Padlet just for this session and it's loaded with different resources. The cool thing about Padlet is I can keep adding stuff to this and you can reap the benefits um, as parents or as providers or support people who are working with youth to pick out whatever resources that you want from here. I'm gonna go through this in pretty good detail tonight, um, but I wanted to start with uh, probably one of my famous, my favorite quotes. Um, I say this to people all the time, disability is the inability to see the ability. Um, if somebody with a disability could, could advocate for themselves, which many kids, can but some can't they would say i want what you want um and really it's all about just finding the resources to get them there and i think um sue susan said that um a couple times she hinted to that in her presentation that um it's everybody should have a meaningful you know outcome after they graduate high school it's not just well let's just get them a diploma or let's just have them repeat a course for the third time or whatever it might be. Um, we need to maneuver people into a position to be successful. And sometimes that just requires extra support. Um, the other one that I really like is this one. I tell parents to ask this question all the time. 
when you're told no, you have to reframe the thinking. How can we do it? I want to do this for my son or daughter. I want you as a school to help me with transportation. How can we do it? Let's make it happen. And then you're moving rocks um, instead of letting rocks pile up. So keep this in your, you know, your, your back pocket as a kind of a, a really good way to get people to really start thinking about, you know, don't put up walls, uh, you know, break them down and try to figure out how we can make it happen. I always like to say, how can we make the ham sandwich? So that's two of my, my uh, favorite um, quotations. Um, the one thing I do want to do, uh, I like to play technology games. So um, can you guys see the, the code on your screen here where I'm highlighting? If you, yes. okay, if you go to this website on your computer or your phone, if you, if you uh, could play along and just go to menti.com and type in this code and then answer this question for me, if you could, uh, what is something that has been on your mind related to transition? Like, what have you been thinking about, um, about uh, transition in general? And once people start, you know, getting in here and playing, it'll start populating um, people's answers down here on the bottom. I'll start seeing people's responses to this question. Something that you have been thinking about or something that's been wavering on your mind related to transition. In any case, anybody's wondering, you know, transition, it, it really can mean whatever you want it to mean. I like to think of it as moving from A to B and getting all the moving parts to work. So whatever you define it as is completely up to you. It's very open-ended. In Wisconsin, it's a journey that starts at 14 for us, but uh, legally in our state, and then it goes all the way through to the age of 21. They're actually thinking about extending that. I don't know if you heard that, Tim. Um, they're thinking about pushing that potentially up to 25, like Michigan. Uh, here's an answer that came in. We will need an entire course to learn everything involved. What do I need to do? When to keep benefits and services? Where can I find a checklist of what things I need to do between the ages of 14 to 21 to help with transition? Okay, that's, that's a good question. And I'm gonna do my best to, uh, to try to help with that one. Barriers to independence, these are good, these are good responses. Everything is different. How do you determine what they need? Who can help? How to find a guardian? How do you provide financial assistance set up for a lifetime? Okay, a lot of, a lot of these questions here, this is the beauty of this wonderful product that uh, Tim and Melissa have put together along with others is that you're gonna get sessions on all this stuff. Um, so these, a lot of these questions are gonna get answered either tonight or somewhere down the road. Um, Tim, I'm gonna share this with you too. Um, how can we prepare students and families better starting in ninth grade? I'm gonna even back this up further and say sixth grade. Choosing the right path to make my child successful when we're no longer here to help him, that's powerful. I often worried about that when I was a special educator. That's a tough conversation to have with parents. Uh, the best options for supporting next steps. I'm assuming this means the next steps that are gonna happen when, when the secondary environment is removed. And just remember when you exit high school, that's when IDEA ends, but the beauty of that is uh, a new thing takes over, which is ADA, which is something that uh, Susan alluded to is the ability to receive accommodations at the post-secondary level is it's based on access, um, whereas in high school, it's based on providing supports and services. So you have a case manager in high school 
uh, in the adult world, you, you don't have that, but you do have people that can help you. You just have to ask for it. So one of the most detrimental things that we see happen, that's the biggest barrier to this is overutilizing and over depending on paraprofessionals. Um, as students get older, it becomes very hard to say no to a para who's been side by your side for you know five, six years. Um, so this is a quandary for a lot of parents. Uh, do I push for this para so that my child will be successful? So they think, or do I foster independence by letting them slip and slide a little bit um, so that we can prepare them better for the next steps? Um, how to help families make decisions about guardianship. This is kind of a, an ongoing theme here. Um, I am focusing on students who know their disability well um, and can advocate for their related needs regarding their disability. These are excellent questions. This is why I do this. This tells me exactly what I need to what I need to talk about. So I'm going to try to tackle some of these by just going back to the Padlet. So thank you for playing. Okay, so the first thing that I want to talk about is probably um, something that will really help families. And Tim is very instrumental in helping with this product. Um, as a matter of fact, it's going to be under revision here soon. Oftentimes, uh, when students are in an IEP meeting, the big three are going to come up. And the big three are independent living, post-secondary education and training, and employment. Those are what we call the, the three pillars of transition. Uh, this resource is focused on the pillar of independent living. And this really, I'm not gonna read through all this, but this is a, a document that'll help families help their child and help the IEP team create meaningful independent living goals that are directed around these focus areas. Navigating the community, making healthy lifestyle choices. Tim, Tim is a big part of this piece here, this meet. Um, being safe and proactive in my decision making, my communication skills, developing a plan for transportation, personal literacy, where am I going to live, what that's going to look like, and then it allows the IEP team to just think about like exposure. Exposure in the community to these different things is so important. Uh, getting kids out and about. You can't duplicate some of this stuff. Uh, through coursework in a in a pullout segregated classroom. You need to get out into the community to experience some of these things and it's trial by fire um, with support. So this is a great resource that's really helpful and it's uh, usually updated annually. Um, something that I'm a huge fan of is uh, our transition app, uh, we're pretty fortunate in Wisconsin to have our own app uh, that youth and families can use collectively to create their own post-secondary transition plan. So part of the transition process, and this will help with the checklist question, is there's a document called the PTP that's required at age 14 and it gets revised every year. So anytime something gets revised, it needs to get uh, re retooled and uh, revamped. So a post-secondary transition plan for a 14 year old is gonna look very different than one for an 18 year old who's going to graduate. There's gonna be a lot more stuff going on in that plan for that 18 year old so if this is done correctly, it's going to be very robust, which means it's it's gonna have some kick to it when it comes to providing an outcome for an exiting student. Um, the, the transition plan is not something that should be done in a silo. It's not something that should be written by a teacher only. It should be a collaborative plan where the student has a voice. And in order to do that, sometimes 
it's best for the student to actually get on their device or the internet or their phone and negotiate this app. The cool thing about the app is we're one of uh, very few states that has this. Um, I know of three states that have a transition plan that's in the form of an app and we're one of them. Um, so we're pretty proud of that. Uh, this allows the student, remember I told you about the big three? Here they are right here. I want a job, I wanna receive some training. Doesn't mean you have to go to college, it just means you need some training. Could be a certificate, it could be an industry recognized credential. Um, cool program up in uh, Indian Head Technical College has a hospitality certificate. It's a six week program where students can earn a hospitality certificate that provides them preferential hiring by hospitality and tourism industries in that area. Um, that's very cutting edge and that's meeting the needs for students with and without disabilities to get job training. And I wanna live on my own. I wanna figure out how to navigate my community independently, including taking care of myself and being safe. Having Maslow's basic hierarchy needs, shelter, food, security. And students can be the driver of this plan and they can start by, sorry. Okay, I said, okay, I wanna do, oh. Oh, it's because I didn't make a choice. It's trying, it's trying to tell me to pick one. I want all three. I'm a high achiever. There we go. Now I can move on it. And it just pushes me as the person that's doing this to start answering some of these questions that really should tell the case manager, hey, if you're a 10th grader, you're not a sixth grader anymore. You're not in middle school at all. You're not a freshman. You're, you're in the middle of your journey. There should be some stuff happening with transition. There should be some focus, focus transition related activities around employment, education and training and independent living. And that's where it's really important for teachers to take the plan of the student, listen to them, listen to the family collaboratively and allow the decisions to be made as a collective group, not just, well, I'm his teacher, so I'm gonna write his transition plan. I'm gonna bypass this app and I'm just gonna write it and everyone's just gonna agree with it because I'm the case manager. Um, that's not the way it should work. This is a team effort and IEP is, it's a individualized educational plan program for a team to incorporate, not just a, a teacher writing a transition plan. And there's coordinated activities that happen in this transition plan that make things come to life. Um, and I'm going to explain that in more detail, but this is the app. It's available on iPhones. It's available on Androids. And it's also available on the internet. And when you get to the end, you can email this to your teacher. That's kind of cool. Uh, I know a lot of teachers that will incentivize their students, you know, doing this, they'll say, Hey, um, you know, you get, you send me your transition plan. And next time we go to Culver's, uh, I'm going to get you, I'm going to, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy for you. You know, I'm buying you lunch, whatever. Brian, yeah. Brian, we do have a, a question in the chat box for you. Yeah. Um, that somebody is asking, what if the child is, for example, six, but mentally still in, in third grade? So does this, this app and transition for those kids that are also um, dealing with some intellectual disabilities? Yes, that's a great question. So we do have some technology devices that schools uh, should know about and have access to that will allow for this uh, to be uh, in a spoken voice, um, it can correlate really well with uh, with picture programs, um, PECs, for example. Uh, we do have some teachers that have gotten very creative about uh, ways to give students a voice in their transition plan by selecting the certain pictures that they see. Um, 
we do have some really good assessments that can be done for students who are nonverbal, um, who are, have limited, um, you know, mobility uh, related disability needs. I like to be careful when I talk about, uh, I just wanna explain something to you that was a source of frustration for me the other day. Um, don't like hearing when people say things like low functioning. Um, we have to be very careful because I don't know about any of you, but I don't think I would really enjoy being called low functioning. So when I hear teachers say that they work with low functioning students, I correct them. And I say, you work with students. It's your job to get them to a place where they're gonna have a meaningful day. And when we, when we refer to somebody as low functioning, we're already pigeonholing them. So I really like to make sure that I speak very intelligently about the students that I serve and I want others to do the same. So I'm a kind of hard nosed that way about making sure we speak on behalf of the people that we're working with. Um, so yes, there's, there's ways that we can, we can modify and accommodate with the, the transition app. If that hopefully that answers that question. Um, some of the transition services that I was talking about are um, are outlined here on the website or on this uh, padlet. Let me. I just want to make sure that I show you things in here that I think are going to be helpful to you. Here's some really good information in this column about supported decision making. There was a lot of people that put things in the Mentimeter about how do I go through the process of guardianship and supported decision making. There's lots of resources here for you to help you with that. Um, I think these three resources all come from our state level experts in this and that's called the board for people with developmental disabilities it's bpdd they put out lots of publications they have a technical assistance hotline um, they have people that uh, can provide technical assistance to families so my best advice would be to look through these resources and contact anybody at bpdd via email or phone to set up a consultation and they'll help you um, that's they're one of the best. Um, Tim, you could you could probably attest to that, that BPDD is, they do some really good grassroots things for our kids. They are so person-centered and empowering and just in the belief that our kids can grow up to be adults who can do anything. And I just love that vision they set. Somebody was talking about a checklist. Here it is right here. This resource, is the cat's meow. Uh, it's called Before Age 18 and it's got um, action steps. So here's here's the kind of a by age uh, list. So I'm just gonna click on, I think this is the toughest place to be trying to figure out how to make a ham sandwich is age 16 because you left this behind you and you got this in front of you. So lots of stuff is happening at 16. Uh, a lot of services start to get mentioned to parents and it's just like, phew, phew. It's like watching a train go down a track, like DVR, ADRC, Independent Living Center, BPDD, TIG, uh, Healthcare Center. And you got all these different, you know, cars that are going really fast past you. And you're trying to remember what's this, how do, what do they do? and Here's where you can kind of, you know, relax a little bit and come here and just say, okay, we're 16. What are some of the things that we need to be doing? A job shadow. This is really important. It's like trying on uh, a pair of pants before you decide you want to buy them. Um, you're going to walk around in them. And you're going to make sure that they fit in places that they're supposed to fit and you're gonna make sure they're the right color. Um, and you're gonna maybe try on a couple 
A job shadow is a great way to get out in the community, uh, visit with an employer virtually or face-to-face -face, and just ask questions, you know, see what they do. I had a student one time do a job shadow, thought they wanted to be a vet tech and that's what we were preparing them for. She went to her job shadow, came back at the end of the day and she was crying. Like, Lexi, what happened? I don't want to do surgery on animals. I don't want to do neutering and spading, yuck. And I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Maybe we, we go back there tomorrow and we see if there's something else that you like about working with animals and we'll not do the vet tech stuff. Okay. She went back the next day and the animal that had just had surgery was in the recovery room. She loved going back there. So we crossed vet tech off the list and we moved her into animal caretaker. Well, guess what she's doing today? She works at Timbavati, which is a zoo in the Dells and she's the lead caretaker and she's doing pretty well. Um, she, she went to the technical college and got her vet tech uh, credentials, um, took the state exam and uh, passed it the second time. And she has that credential, but she, she's an animal caretaker and she's been there for 10 years now. Um, and I don't think she'll plan to change her mind. I think she'll stay there and make it a career. Uh, but this is where the rubber meets the road for kids and they find out, you know, can I do an apprenticeship? Maybe I don't need to go to college. Maybe an employer will pay for my training. Um, I had a student with pretty significant um, autistic needs that went and worked a job at Kalahari and he was employee of the year for the entire resort. Not just the Dells property, Sandusky and the Poconos. Um, he's the best of the best. And he was a pretty high needs uh, student in high school when it came to, um, you know, needing to meet with him on a daily basis to just kind of debrief and lots of meetings with employers, but we never gave up and we just kept on trying to find jobs that were right for him, like the job shadow is really important at 16. So when you come here, you can really get some good grounding ideas about and there's topics on here that are all kind of the big, the big ones that get discussed. And I mentioned a lot of these already. A lot of these should sound familiar from that independent living goals uh, sheet. And then there's a lot of resources in here for families and youth. So Melissa, how much time do I have left? Cause I'll just ramble on. You have about 10 minutes, Brian. Well, we have about 10 minutes. So okay. about seven more. All right. Yeah. So I have, so I'm going to keep rambling then. Wrap up real quick at the end. But yeah. You just give me the, you just give me the cutoff signal when I'm, when you need me to be done. Tim, we'll, you just, can, we'll, we'll boot you out of the room, Brian. Don't okay, worry. That's fine. I'll just keep on going. <laughs> I'll be talking and nobody will be there. I've done that before. Um, I think it's important to get inspired. Um, this is an awesome video. Uh, I, I want to, I want to share this video. It's not very long. It's probably one of my favorites and you best have, uh, some, uh, some Kleenex nearby. It's a, it's a doozy. Okay. Hopefully this will work. Sounds good. I feel like it's turning to the star, having a job. Maybe we can demonstrate to the world that people with disabilities can perform as well or better. Just in case you're wondering, this is not a facility that employs just people with disabilities. This is a manufacturing facility that prides itself on hiring people with disabilities. So this is not a workshop. Um, I just want to make sure I make that very clear that 
This is an inclusive work floor right here. I have um, autism, learning disability, and hearing loss. I have a mixture of all three, which is pretty hard, but a good battle for life. <laughs> we'll get some fresh air, Jules. <laughs> Julie has a genetic disorder. The hospital doctors told me if she survived, she'd be a vegetable. She's been through so much and still managed to be successful. What is that? My school graduations. Back in my school years were really bad because I have been bullied. I didn't even know what they didn't like about me that made them walk away. Julie having a job is a dream that we all never thought would come true. People with disabilities die a death of a thousand cuts when it comes to getting a job. And maybe we can do more. I was Walgreens chief supply chain officer for 16 years. And my son, Austin, has autism. You're making me remember. Well, you remember things well. <laughs> Sometimes we don't. Austin didn't talk till he was 10, but today he drives and works. I underestimated Austin over and over and over, and he surprised me again and again and again. I came to the conclusion there was a whole group of people out there probably that could do the job as well or better that we were unjustly leaving behind. What we did was hire a thousand people with disabilities. 10% of our entire workforce in the logistics workforce, earning the same pay, doing the same jobs side by side. The first building turned out to be the most productive in the history of our company. People with disabilities work safer, retention is better, absenteeism is less. As simple as that. I work at the Walgreens Distribution Center and I do SPS picking. They even have a nickname for me, they call me Speedy. I can pick so fast that the machine can sometimes end up breaking. <laughs> when I first started, I was very nervous because I didn't know if I was entering the past again. I felt like the minute I entered the doors of walking the past, well, there's a difference between having an existence and having a life. Julie just wants to fit in with everybody else. <laughs> when I first walked into my job, I didn't realize love was coming next, too. Do I walk No, I put that over there on purpose. Oh. Austin has few pleasures. One of his seasonal pleasures is taking cattails that come in the fall, and he likes to pull them apart and watch the seeds float around. I was forced to look past the autism to see Austin. I think we have demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt that people with disabilities can do the job. Try it. If it doesn't work, what would you really lose? It'll take a lot more people doing this. But if we can move the world that millionth of an inch, it makes it all worthwhile. They just like you for who you are. And it's been a bit time to my life. Any, you know, four minutes left here, any reactions to that video? You can come off mute if you want. I think we've set the framework for people can, there's a comfort level in this group. Anybody wanna, wanna share? Just thank you for sharing it. It's, it's my favorite right now. I mean, 
I go through stages. You know, I had a favorite video for about oh, four or five months and it just got knocked off by that one. Definitely needed Kleenex. Yeah, that one speaks to you because it's an employer, mm -hmm. you know, and he's not just an employer. It's, it's Walgreens, like, yeah. you know, the Walgreens. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I think if we can continue to have relationships vocationally with, you know, businesses, and then they can, like he said, the retention and just the rapport and the abilities and attributes they can contribute to the community is just, you know, something that oh, yeah. businesses will just continue to gravitate towards, hopefully. Yeah, so I'm gonna find this guy. <laughs> I, I told my boss the other day, I'm like, when we can get back to, to traveling again, I'm gonna go find him. Well, there's a Walgreens and, headquarters not far from us on uh, night. Uh, yeah. Wonder it's the forest, right? Or Windsor? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder a, what they do there. I don't know. I might have to find somebody in that place that knows this guy. Like I don't know where I don't know where she's from or um, but um it's a cool story. And it's it's happening everywhere. We just need it to happen in more places. And employers speak to other employers and they listen. It's just like parents, when parents can share stories with other parents. It makes being a parent a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully this was beneficial. I really enjoyed. Um, Susan, are you still on? I think she is. Yes. Yeah, okay. I'm here. Yeah, thanks for sharing your story. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you to both of you. You're welcome. I'm was looking forward to this all day. I, I like working at night. I get, I get more done. I've been working from home since February, so I'm, I'm about ready to he'll be done with it. I used to, I'm usually traveling to schools and visiting places and seeing youth events, and I can't do that. So when I get a chance to be on with, you know, parents and youth, I'm just a kid in a candy store. Well, I can't tell you how, you know, obviously all of us know how overwhelming sometimes it is. So it's great to have such great resources and such great people. Thank you, Melissa. You're too. welcome. Yeah. You, are, you, are you all in um, the DeForest district? No. Okay. So from, from all over? Around half of the people that are registered um, are associated with the Forest District, but half are not. We have people from Green County, Columbia County, um, as well as the rest of Maine. Nicole, if you don't mind me asking, where where are you? Where are you located? I'm in, I'm in DeForest. You are okay. Yes. And how about you, Jen? Uh, I work with Melissa at I, my first year at DeForest High School. Oh, okay. Very cool. And what other um, I can't see everybody, so I know there's other parents on here. Sue Ellen, where are you, where are you from? I work with Melissa at DeForest High School and Jen. Oh, you do? Okay. You make sure you keep Matt Andrews in line. He, I always do. Yep. You tell him that Brian Kenny said he needs to square himself away. I know Matt real well. Who's this guy? Ethan wants to say hi to Sue Allen. Hi, <laughs> hi oh. I miss you. Oh, I miss he's, you. Air hugs, buddy. Is he photo bombing? Yeah. My, my kids do that all the time. <laughs> it's, it's like the minute. From multiple locations. So Can I'm I just gonna I'm I'm gonna quickly butt in and let Melissa do any closing stuff that she needs to do. Um, I will keep the room open, Brian. If you want to keep talking to people oh, for the okay. rest I've, of the night, I probably I'll keep it open. Go. No big deal. Um, but we do um, need to just do some wrap up and make sure that we honor people's time. So Melissa. All right. I am just going to share my slideshow again.
Um, okay, just a couple announcements and thank you, Suzanne and Brian, both. That was so great. Such a great kickoff for our series. Um, I know we're all really excited for um, the next couple months and um, this really, really went to prove that um, it's gonna, it's gonna be great. Um, so after the presentation, you'll receive a survey and I, Tim also put it in the chat. Um, so you can go to the link right there and we would love to hear your thoughts about um, the, the training and um, your thoughts on future trainings, um, all of that. Um, this presentation, like I said, was recorded um, and it will be available on YouTube um, if you search for Transition Talk Tuesdays. Um, and the presentation and the resources that um, Brian presented will be available on the um, Southern Regional Center for Children and Youth with Special Healthcare Needs um, Transition Tuesdays website. Um, and Brian, uh, Tim, if you wanna put a link for that in the chat. Um, and the Autism Society of South Central Wisconsin, one of our partners in this, um, they wanted to make sure that we let you all know that um, there is a scholarship um, available and information will be sent in a follow-up email. Um, and the scholarship is available to any post-secondary program. Linnea, did you have anything you wanted to add about that? No, that's great. There's just, there's no age limit um, and it can be any post-secondary training. It doesn't have to be um, a degree. So please apply. Cool. Um, okay, and again, here's just our upcoming trainings. Um, so we hope to see you all there. Um, you know, we feel like we have a, a really great, um, great agenda of um, different opportunities to learn about in the next few months. And um, hope to see you back again. And just thank everybody for coming. Um, and thank you again, Suzanne and Brian. And we'll see you on February 9th. Thanks, Melissa. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Is there anybody else you wanted to talk to, Brian? Oh, I, if, if people want to stay on, I'm... Well, you know I'll talk with you. Oh, I know you will. <laughs> Kim, are you at the forest, too? Okay. It's like we've had a lot of deforest. This is awesome.